my friends, this is Chad Kalick, and welcome back to episode 22 of the In a Crowded Room podcast, which is the continuation, part two, of the story of the billionaire who only ate fries. So where we left off, Greg Humble had just went to a room and came back with a handful of documents to show me because I asked to see the bank statements that he used to confirm to my friend Mike that he was, in fact, who he was. And what he presented to me was a number of bank statements, ledgers, all kinds of banking information with his name on it, including a number to call at First National Bank to his private banker. So I asked him to call his banker. I said, have a conversation. Let me hear. And he does. What appears to be a banker at First National Bank answers the phone in which Greg just asks a few questions. Basically, you know, is the transfer going to be in when I think it's going to be in? You know, will it clear on this day? Just, you know, a few basic questions. But it does appear as though the person on the phone is a banker. It does appear as though it's a bank. You can hear activity in the background. So I'm sitting here looking at ledgers with all kinds of transactions, over $15 million in one account, over $7 million in the other account, over like $30 million in another account, and there's a wire transfer for $20 million. He has what appears to be a wire transfer document for $20 million. It all looks real. It all looks real. In which he says to me, I don't know why you think that I'm fake. And I say to him, Greg, come on, look at this, man. You know, you show up, supposedly you get mugged, you have no ID, you're living off people. You're driving Mike's car around, everybody's financing your life right now. He's like, but that's just, you know, for another day or two. And I'm like, well, it's been a day or two, and you're not telling people, oh, yeah, I'll have my stuff tomorrow, I'll pay you back. You're just still operating within the city. And he goes, well, I'm going to pay everybody back, and it's going to happen, and it's just going to be literally another day, maybe two, 48 hours max, and I'm going to take care of it, and then you'll see. And I'm like, okay, well, I hope so. I hope that's the case. And he says, it will be the case. You will see. And in the meantime, would you do me a favor? And I say, what? And he says, there's a team of producers that are making a film, and they want me to invest in the movie in which I told them I would consider doing so, but I would want my own full-time producer on board. And I say to him, Greg, listen, I can't accept any kind of job from you, man. I'm blatantly calling you out and saying that, you know, I don't believe you are who you are. I have real reservations. And he said, no, I understand that. He goes, just come with me to the meeting. Let me know if these guys are real. Let me know if you would work with them. If they're people that you think are quality, if they know the business, do you think that they're actually going to make this movie that they're presenting? Because I'm really interested in working with them. If they're real, I like the concept of the film. And I guess at that point, what I was thinking is, this is another way to really test Greg, A, to see who he's meeting with, but B, to see his knowledge on filmmaking, on the industry, that type of thing. And I say, well, you know, where's this meeting going to happen? He goes, oh, it's just a coffee street over on 3rd. You can just bounce in really quickly and bounce out. It'll take 20 minutes out of your day. So I'm like, okay, I guess I came over. I asked to see these banking documents. Everything from what I know. Now, keep in mind, I'm not a banker. But everything that I can see appears to be authentic. The thing that kept sticking in my head is I still just don't have anything that says he's this. He has no ID. So... For all I know, he's the person at LAX who mugs somebody, you know? Could be that. That crossed my mind the whole time. But I say, okay, well, let's go meet these guys and and let's see what's up. So I do. The meeting was a couple hours later and I go with Greg to meet these filmmakers. And they're really nice guys that actually seem to have their shit together. I can tell through the whole meeting that they're extremely skeptical of Greg. They're asking all the right questions about him as an investor They definitely know the lingo. These guys are real filmmakers. They've done a couple independent films that have done pretty well before. And they're just trying to scrape up independent money. And I can see that they are just confused by Greg in general. So we have a good lunch. It's fine. I ask all the questions I need to ask afterwards. You know, Greg says to me, so what do you think of these guys? 
I said, I think they're real. I think they're legitimate. They're trying to make some moves. I've never worked with them before, but they certainly are asking all the right questions. They, you know, have some uh, some strong ideas as far as, you know, how to keep the cost down of the film. And they have, uh, you know, a couple of films they've made that they've released that have done well. I think they're solid. I think that if you truly like the script, you know, these guys might be worth working with. And he was like, well, great. That's all I really wanted to know. Thank you so much. I'm like, okay, cool. Take care, Greg. And I go home. That's it. But when I get back to my place, Clint's there and he's pissed off. I'm like, what's up? And he's like, I don't trust this Greg guy at all. What happened? So I kind of fill him in. I'm like, I saw these bank ledgers. I saw these transfers for millions of dollars. <laughs> he called a live banker on the phone. I was just at a meeting with a fairly legitimate company that he's talking about financing their film. And he's going, you know what? I don't believe any of it at all. And I'm going to find out who this dude is one way or the other. And I could tell he's really pissed like something else happened that I don't know of. And I'm going, well, what's up, dude? And he's going, you just can't do this, man. You can't come into people's lives and make them promises. These people are desperate. These actors, they'll they'll do anything for this, you know, this opportunity. And he's using people. He's hurting people. And I'm like, okay. And it dawns on me that I think he's talking about his new Mexican girlfriend that he's dating and that he really likes. And I'm like, well, did something happen, you know, with the girl? And he's like, I don't want to talk about it. And I'm like, huh. And to this day, he never actually told me what happened, but something happened between Greg and her that really rubbed him the wrong, wrong way. And the one thing I know about my boy Clint, when, when he sets his sights on somebody, <laughs> you know, I knew that Clint would get to the bottom of it somehow. He would find out somehow who this guy was. And I was really interested to know myself as well, obviously. And while Clint's there, I get a phone call, and it's one of the producers we just met with. And I'm like, hey, dude, what's up? And he's like, hey, can we talk to you a second? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, like, alone? Are you, are you with Greg right now? And I'm like... No. I go, yeah, no, go ahead, man. What's up? And he's like, well, we're just trying to figure something out. And I'm like, what? And he goes, well, why are you in business with Greg? I go, oh, dude, I'm not in business with Greg. He goes, you're not. I go, no. And he goes, you're not overseeing his whole film division. You're not a longtime friend of his that's a producer and I'm like, absolutely not, man. And he goes, wow, okay. And I'm like, why did he say that? He goes, oh, yeah. No, he sold us that he had this long-term friend that was, you know, a really smart guy that knew, that knew his shit, knew the industry, knew everything. And that was you. And we show up and you, uh, you know, you appear to know what you're talking about. And we just couldn't figure out, you know, why you're with him. And I go, wow. So kind of validation by proximity huh and he goes yeah you know you were with him so we figured you know he must be real to some degree I go, yeah there's a lot of that going on huh and i go well no guys i'm not working with him um in any capacity and i do wish you the best but uh he just asked me to come to basically vet you guys to see if you guys were legitimate or not which to be honest i told them i said i was vetting him the same way you guys were and he goes, yeah, he's like, what a weird scenario this guy is. And I go, yeah. And he goes, hey, can I ask you a question? And I go, yeah. And he goes, did you notice that he only ate fries at lunch? I go, yeah, that's it. That's all he eats is fucking fries. Pounds of them. Pounds of them. So I get off the phone. And a few seconds later, the phone rings again. This time, it's Mike Callahan. I'm like, hey, what's up, Mike? And he goes, hey, where are you at? I'm like, oh, I'm at home. And he goes, can you come over to my place right now before Greg gets home? And I go, well, I was actually just like with Greg. He should be home any moment. He goes, no. He called me and left a message saying that he had some running around to do. And he has my car right now. I go, oh, Jesus, you're still letting me drive your car? And he goes, it's the only thing he's been driving is my car. Well, Mike only lives like five minutes from me. So I cruise over to his place, walk in, and he's like, listen. And he hits play on his answering machine. And it is... The gal from Malibu that was showing him the $60 million property. 
in which she is letting him know that the time has come and gone for his deposit to basically, you know, be posted for this property because he claimed he wanted to move forward immediately with the purchase. And not only that, she cannot show him the additional properties that she was scheduled to show him because they cannot verify his worth, his income, his assets, anything. They can't verify anything. And when she explains, interestingly enough, in the message that she went ahead against her better judgment and showed him the $60 million property because he wanted to see it on a Saturday and he got his information into her late on a Friday. So in good faith, they went ahead and showed him the property on Saturday without getting everything verified on Friday. So this whole thing was a scam by him. He set this up to make sure the timing was off where he could not be verified on a Friday so they could show him the property on a Saturday. Now, I have no idea how he got Casper Van Dien roped into this, but my guess is the same way he got me roped into this damn meeting by proximity, validation by relationship. I know this person, this person's credible, so I must be credible. That's how this guy's doing this. And I look at Mike and I go, hey, you need to get your car back right away. Whatever this guy's doing, he's in your vehicle right now. And he's cruising all over the city, telling all kinds of people, all kinds of lies. You have no idea what he's roping people into. And he's meeting with some powerful people. So he needs to get out of your house. And we need to get, you know, your car back, all this stuff. And Mike's like freaking out. And I can tell he's also hurt as much as he's scared. Because he just wanted this to happen. And I look at him and I go, Mikey. He looks at me and I go, listen to me, look at me. And he looks at me and I go, you can make it in this business. You don't need him. This was never real. There's no such thing as fairy tales and shortcuts, man. It's hard ass work and I believe in you. Let this go. And he goes, ah, oh, man, I know. Why did I let myself believe in this? And I go, because you want to make it, because you, you want to, you know, show the world what you can do. And it's a hard business, man, where you don't get the chance to show that you can shine very often. And this guy knows this and he's using this. And right now he's using you. And I need to make sure that you're going to be okay when this is all said and done. It's quiet and Clint goes, I'm going to find out exactly who this guy is. And Clint leaves the room. I don't know what he does, but he went back to where this guy had his paperwork and he walks out and he says, give me 30 minutes. And I'm like, okay. I don't know what he did. I don't know what he did. I, I'm not even going to guess. I don't know. I went home at that time. Clinton went home. And I just sat around waiting for the next phone call to see what this guy was up to. Suddenly I get a knock on the door. I look at the people. It's Clint. No phone call. It just came straight over. Knock on the door. I open the door. Clint walks in and says, he's broke as hell. His last known residence was in Louisville, Kentucky. He's got nothing, man. He's got nothing. He's an ex-con. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, he's done time. I'm like, for what? He's like, assault and attempted murder. I'm like, Jesus Christ, are you kidding me? And he goes, yeah, I wish I was. I'm not. This guy's a dangerous dude. We got to get him out of here. We need to figure something out fast. So basically what we decide is whenever he comes home that night, like nothing's wrong, we're going to just let him go to bed, do his thing. Mike is going to get out of the house along with his roommates. He has two roommates, actually, that lives with him. They're going to get out of the house. And then that following morning, Clint's going to go through the front door, and I'm going to wait by the back door. Clint's going to tell him that he knows everything about his past, and he's got to grab his shit and disappear, or we're going straight to the FBI. Because at that point, as much as we know about him, he hasn't committed a crime yet to us. It's not a crime to ask Mike to sleep on his couch. It's not a crime to not be verified for a house. It's not a crime to borrow somebody's car. But clearly this guy is a dangerous, dangerous individual that's unstable. So I'm going to wait at the back door because if he comes through the back door, the only reason he's coming through the back door is because he assaulted Clint, got in some fight, or he's trying to do something dirty. So I'm waiting back there thinking, God, I, you know, <laughs> like I told you guys, I don't love violence at all. I don't like it. I just grew up with it my whole life. It just turns my stomach. But I'm certainly willing to engage in it when it comes to protecting somebody I love and care about. So my adrenaline is on 10. I'm just waiting, waiting for this back door to open because I don't know what Clint is saying to him. 
I can't hear them talking, nothing. I'm just waiting by this back door. And I'll tell you what, had anybody walked through that back door at that time, they were getting shit canned. I mean, I was just so amped up. And I'm just sitting there and just watching the back door. I'm watching the back door and I'm thinking, God, he's going to come through any second. You know, get up, Chad, get up. You know, you got to take this dude out the second he comes through here. And all of a sudden, Clint walks around the corner and says, hey, man, let's go grab a coffee real quick and let's come back. I'm like, okay. I go, what happened? And he goes, I just made it clear that he's got to go now, period. I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. And I was like, so what's he doing? He goes, I don't know. He goes, is he packing his stuff up? And he goes, he wasn't packing a second ago. I go, what was he doing? And he goes, he was sitting in his underwear on the couch, staring at the ground. I go, really, like defeated? He goes, yeah. I go, well, let's do this, man. I go, let's just go grab something to drink and let's come back. Let's just make sure he gets everything out of Mikey's place. Let's make sure that we see him leave. And I don't care where he goes, but I want to make sure that we see him leave. And Clint's like, okay, we can do that. Let's just grab some a drink real quick and we'll head back over. So we do. Clint grabs a coffee. I grab a soda. We're maybe gone for five minutes. Not even that. We come back. We see down the street. Down the street, a good three or four blocks. Greg's just running. <laughs> we see him running. We go inside. He's left everything. He's left everything. All the documents are left behind. Everything. All the extra clothes he had. I mean, the only thing he took was the clothes he was wearing. Which tells me all of that stuff was stolen. None of that stuff was his. That wasn't his name. All of it was stolen. This guy is an unbalanced con man. A total con man. And how is he getting into these circles? I hate to say it. Hope and greed. Hope and greed. You know, I felt so bad for my buddy Mike because he just wanted a shot. He wanted somebody to give him the chance to prove that he can do it. And he wanted it so bad, he was willing to overlook obvious details. Obvious details. And Clint's girlfriend that he had for a short time, because they were not dating after this all happened. So again, I don't know what happened between that girl and Greg, but I have a pretty good idea. She was an actress that was trying to make it too, and my guess is she did something he wanted. And that really hurt Clint. But she believed. She believed. So badly, she wanted to believe, and she did. Penny Marshall is meeting with this guy, you know? Why did Penny Marshall rest in peace and meet with this guy? Well, he probably did the same thing. He probably gave just enough details to make it gray as far as who he was. And the potential of receiving $15 million was just something that, you know, he just couldn't walk away from that lunch. And the whole time, he's using, he's using that to confirm who he is. It's just like those producers that met. They thought he was somebody because he was with me, and I knew the lingo, and I knew the business. So he had to be somebody. He had to be somebody. And I was guilty of doing the same damn thing. I'm going, he's meeting with Penny Marshall. He's got to be somebody. He has Casper Van Dien with him. He's got to be somebody. He's looking at, you know, multi-million dollar houses. He's got to be somebody. But the whole time, a little voice inside of me was just going, there's nothing about this that's right. There's nothing about this that's right. We never heard from Greg Humble again. Thankfully, there was nothing that he did that brought back any heat to my buddy Mike. It was just a serious, serious life lesson to always listen to that voice inside you, but to also keep your eyes open because when a story doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. It's Aquan's razor, right? It's like <laughs> the most obvious answer is the answer. Like that's what it is. He was a con man. I knew it from the jump. I can't even believe that I allowed myself to even consider that he was anything other than that. And it's the same damn thing with Jesse Smollett. I'm sure all of those first responders <laughs> were exactly like I was when I talked to Laura. And I said, something about this isn't right. Something about this isn't right. 
There's enough gray here that maybe, but this doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. So why did Jesse lie like that? The same reason that this guy was lying, saying he was Greg Umble. He wanted a better life. He wanted to be somebody that he's not. Jesse wanted to be a household name, and he didn't want to work for it. You know, this Greg Humble guy, his tools were hope and greed, right? Use that against everybody. Just by saying you're a billionaire and acting eccentric. With Jesse, his tools were hate crimes and racism. And a modern culture, you know, a nation divided. Use that on the Tupac of acting. You know, like Greg Humble saying, my new record label is going to be so damn successful, Dr. Dre can't even get in the door. I'm the new Jimmy Ivy. I mean, it's the same damn thing. But how we combat that, we call it like we see it. No matter what, we call it like we see it and we stand by it. And I wish I would have done that right away. The first night when I met him, I wish I would have just said to his face, listen, dude, you're a con man. I know it. I'm not going to let this go. And you're going to have to go to the end of the earth to prove to me that you are who you say you are. And until you do, until you do, not another person in this room is going to buy you another goddamn french fry. Thank you all for listening to episode 22 of the Inner Crowded Room podcast. I'll be back tomorrow with more. All the best.